Hello everybody and welcome to be to be talks number nine. We don't want to put the fake clapping in the background, so it would be good if you will cooperate. So first of all, I heard the traffic was horrendous, so thank you everyone that actually managed to arrive. Okay, I believe that we will have a, a drop of a small amount of people coming in um, during the event itself. Um, we started to do B2B talks because we saw that there are a lot of very smart B2B marketers that are actually don't have a forum to share the knowledge with others. That was point number one. Point number two was that there is a way to get free beer. So the connection between the two created this event. Uh, first of all, I want to start by thanking our partners. Uh, the guys from Trendyman, please raise your hands. Woo! Trendyman um, is an awesome marketing technology platform. They are supporting these events for several, uh, several times already. Um, feel free to talk with them after the event. Uh, awesome guys and awesome product that we also use for our own marketing efforts. Um, our uh, second partner are Medak Knasim. As you know, last year we were involved in several B2B marketing events in Israel. Uh, done by Medak Nassim. Uh, they were kind enough to uh, offer us to support them with content, and they were kind enough uh, to offer us uh, to support us with this event as well. So thank you very much, guys. Okay, today we're going to talk about innovation. The thing is, B2B is usually considered as boring to boring. Let's do several events, we'll have MQLs. We'll send it to sales, sales will not look at them, and the world goes on. Uh, we've created this event to get some spice into B2B marketing. And we're doing it in two ways. First of all, we're starting with an interview uh, with Inbala Vieli. She knows me when I was like 20 years ago, something like, in, yeah, a bit more. So she has tons of extremely embarrassing stories. Um, and then we'll go to a panel with uh, Tomo Tsuke from IBM. <laughs> Rafi Kretschmer from Panaya. Where is he? <laughs> and David Geffen from NICE. <laughs> okay, so as we said, we know for a very long time but tell me a bit about what you're doing today. Thanks, Fear. So hi, good evening, everyone. Very happy to be here. I'm usually not invited to be a professional speaker at marketing events, and that's just because I'm not from the marketing angle, okay? Um, I'm more in the doing than in the telling, um, and I really appreciate and value the, the art of telling. So um, kudos to you all, and uh, I have a lot to learn for you. Um, since we've met 20 plus years ago, I've developed my career in the Israeli high tech. Um, started as a general counsel, as a legal lawyer. Um, boring, boring to boring to boring, but actually uh, provided me with a great skill set of um, knowledge, experience, and tools relevant to the business world. And in the past 10 years, and I had the privilege to work with some of Israel's most amazing entrepreneurs. Um, the Vertimer family, Sami Segal with Keta, Dov Moran with Modu, uh, really uh, by, by luck, but, but amazing uh, people to learn from. And in the past seven years plus, I've been creating um, supportive vehicles, mostly for early stage startups here in Israel, but not only, um, and currently holding a position in an organization called Startup Nation Central, which is a nonprofit organization bridging between world leading organizations, business and government, and the Israeli ecosystem. I'm leaving Startup Nation Central 
you're actually the first audience to whom I'm saying that uh, formally to the camera. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm actually doing that to focus on a book I'm writing um, about the Israeli roots of entrepreneurship. If we have time, we can touch also upon that. I live in Tel Aviv, I'm 41 years old, and I have three very active boys and a dog. Okay, so you've mentioned through all the parts of your career, one company that, it really depends how you look at the story of this company, and I'm talking about Modu, right? Dov Moran, those who don't know, don't know the story, Dov Moran, after huge success in the industry, started a new company, and now the, the narrative depends on the, on the teller, right? Some would say, oops, some would say, wow, okay? So tell us a bit more about how, in the context of innovation, how do you see Modu? So Dove sold M Systems at the end of 2006 and immediately um, thought of starting Modu. Um, again, I was lucky and I had the privilege to meet him at that time um, specifically and invited to join the core team, the founding team, if you want, of, of his new adventure. Modu started with huge hopes and it was an amazing promise. M Systems was one of the biggest transactions in Israeli high tech ever, still to date, $1.7 billion. And Dove was, you know, at the, the, the peak of wherever you can be. Before the iPhone, remember? Nobody had iPhones, it didn't exist. We all had those either uh, Blackberries or the Nokias, um, simple phones. And Dove came with a promise to change the, the telecommunication world, the way, the way we use phones. Within a year, we raised $120 million. We grew from a group of three, four people to more than 80. We opened five subsidiaries around the world. Um, Dove was quoted all over the press saying that um, the next Nokia, which was huge then, okay, uh, will be set here in Israel. The press covered um, the visit of the company to the World Mobile Conference, where we kind of uh, um, attacked the visitors with Tic Tacs and made a lot of noise talking about marketing, by the way, and efficient marketing. And really, it was all over. It was a huge, huge promise. Obviously, something happened, okay? Because fast forward three years, not even three years, um, Modu closed. And those 300 employees that were eventually part of this amazing adventure found themselves in other places. And um, we all know history. Um, the iPhone in, came out in late 2007, completely changed the world of telecommunication. And Modu was not agile enough, was not flexible enough to adapt and change its uh, go-to-market strategy. So back to your question now, was it a success or a failure? Both. Uh, in my opinion, it was definitely a huge success. Um, I always say that those $120 million were probably the highest stipend that someone gave to uh, 300 people who went through an amazing business school, okay? Probably better than Harvard, in my opinion. Um, but, but here are some facts. So first, the IP, the intellectual property of Modu, was sold. Um, it was sold to Google. It was sold to Google, and today, we're in 2017, seven years after the company was closed, this intellectual property is the basis of the Aura project, the modular phone by Google. So that, you might say, is a first small success. But actually, the bigger success is that 32 startups were actually initiated by people who worked at Modu, who were part of that big failure. But when Modu closed, decided that not only they're not looking for something more secure, they're actually starting their own startups. 
So 32 new startups, out of which, by the way, some were already acquired. Um, Onavu, which was acquired by Facebook, is one of those. Others are still growing. Um, Mintigo, um, Interlude, okay, and other examples. Some obviously closed. But a lot of activity, a lot of innovation was actually generated by people who were part of that experience. And, and that, in, in my opinion, is definitely a success. Okay, so when we're talking about innovation, it usually means do something that other people didn't do before, right? And then there is a risk of failure. So I just want to ask some people here by show of hands, how many of you completely failed in the past, in their past? Work-related, personal-related, I mean like, on the, as we say in Hebrew, on the face, okay? Like completely fail. No, okay. All entrepreneurs over there. Tomer, I will grill you later. Okay. Okay, the reason I want to talk about failures specifically is because according to some of the research we've done, this is one of the biggest differentiators between societies that manage to innovate and societies that do not manage to do that. So can you give us like a little glimpse into that? Sure, yeah, so I'm fascinated by um, the courage that entrepreneurs have to try. Let's start with that. Statistics all over the world are the same. Um, if you take Israel and Silicon Valley and other places in the world, statistics talk about 90% of failure and, and maximum 10% of success. And that doesn't change from one place to the other. What does change are two things. A, what is the pie? How many are trying? Okay, so what is the 100%? And the second thing, how open are people to talk about their failures, to, to, regard, to, to, to refer to their failures as failures? The fact that you even ask that question is one thing. The fact that people even answered it is another thing that in other, even ecosystem of entrepreneurship around the world would not happen. Okay? The, even the question by itself is kind of rude. Why would I tell you about my failures? Okay? So statistically, we're probably like other places in the world, but the fact is that here we're really more open to talk about it. Um, and let me give you some cultural examples. Uh, first is the definition of failure. So I went and checked, and, and the Oxford Dictionary um, defines failure as a lack of success. So it's binary, success or failure. When you go to the Hebrew dictionary, Evan Shushan dictionary, the definition is that long, okay? And it's so gray. It's uh, an attempt to do something, a trial. It's really much broader than just not succeeding in doing. And that's our language, okay? But, but language has a lot of importance in terms of our culture. Then I looked in more places, and, and I was trying of, of thinking of my kids. I have three boys, as I told you. Thinking of some, I, I know by, by looking at you that are, there are some parents here in the audience. Um, think of the story of the Maaseh B'chamisha Balonim, of the five balloons. And think of the tragedy that's happening in that story, okay? The kids are playing with balloons, but all the balloons, keep, keep, they keep exploding, and it's like repetitive, right? It's one balloon after the other, one. Yeah, that flies to the sky. Completely zen ending, right? Exactly. It flies to the sky. Right, and, and it's a whole strategy for kids. Now, for those of you who have small kids, it's a strategy that a balloon explodes. But the message of the story is, if you remember, lo nora ron iron, sofo shel kol balon. So although we know it's, that's how it's supposed to be, the kids and, and us as parents keep letting them play with that. Or for those of you who are a little more um, experienced in life, like, like we are, Yatsik from Zeuze. How many of you know him, remember him? Okay, who remembers Yatsik's tagline? What did he Perfect. He always falls and gets back. Now, 
think of those uh, in the 80s, one channel, 100% of rating, everybody used to look, to, 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 to look at that show, okay? Teenagers, kids, and the message of Yatek was kids, yeladim lo lidog leolam, kids never worry, Yatek always falls and gets back. And that's a repetitive message. Now, nobody really thought strategically of educating kids towards failure, okay? We're not that long-term thinking, right? But it's in our culture. And this is exactly those um, cultural components that I think defer Israel from other places around the world. And it's definitely relevant to innovation and to entrepreneurship. Okay, before we finish this, uh, this uh, part of the event, eh? first of all, what I've learned from the story about the balloons, always take the red balloon, okay? But um, all the people here are looking for tips how to create innovative organization, innovative teams, uh, innovative way of thinking, because innovation is culture. It's not only a process, it's a cultural aspect. What are your tips for people here that are running marketing organization on how to create an actual innovative and innovation-based culture in their companies? So I think that if you're working in Israel and you are based on human capital, Israeli human capital, you have 90% of the equation already in your favor. Because as I said, we're brought to think innovatively. And that's great. The only question is, how do we create the right environment for this mindset, which is natural to us, to actually you know, come to the ground? And I think the m most important tip I can give is not to do, but is what, not what to do, but actually what not to do. And from all my experience in bigger organization and smaller startups um, and bigger corporates is we are sometimes so you know, busy with the day-to-day -day, day -day goals and, 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 and tasks that we have. I'm thinking of management meetings, for example. In, in all of the organizations, I was part of the executive team. Usually, it's just getting together around a table and updating, okay? Each executive is updating the others and sharing information about what's going on. It's very rarely a conversation, a discussion, a brainstorming where we are all free to think and to brainstorm together, although the brain power is in the room. So what I try to do, at least with, with the teams that I'm involved in, is, is to create some kind of mechanism and say, for example, let's update, but always let's have time, which is secured, to raise the bottlenecks. Okay, what are the two bottlenecks that each executive, each responsible, each leader, each person on the team has? Raise the problem and make sure to leave enough time to discuss it together, because most probably the answers would be around the table. You just need to be minded and, and free of chasing um, every day's tasks to let it go on the surface. And, and the brain power is there, the innovative power is, is all there. Let's just, you know, free the table to create the conversation. Thanks a lot for uh, sharing your knowledge and experience in this area. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Important. Okay. So, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, the amazing cutter of speakers that we have here. Uh, Thomas Zucker from IBM. <laughs> David Geffen from NICE. <laughs> and Rafa Kretschmer from Panay. <laughs> So we have only one microphone, okay? So you have to play nice together. Um, we are going to talk today about innovative B2B marketing projects that you've done, okay? So let's start by a short introduction of the challenge that you had and the project you did and why it's so cool. Make sense? 
in three questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Um, beer to beer talk, right? Beer to beer. Yeah. Trademark. <laughs> okay. So um, it's it's a big question, you know, innovative marketing. But I think in the daily, you know, day to day life, um, and this is something I would like to talk is is more to be productive and efficiency and efficient. Okay, um, I think this is the basis. Uh, so um, I think that the main challenge is to bring the real value for the organization. Okay, and I'm, when I'm talking about real value, I'm talking about you know results, real results, money, wins. So um, I think my main uh, um, you know challenge is to find the right marketing activity that will generate real revenue. So um, it's not uh, maybe risking 100% of my budget on very innovative and cool project. I do that also, but uh, to bring real value. Okay. So um, my main challenge was actually the follows. Um, everyone in the industry worldwide um, knows of NICE. So it's pretty simple to also position NICE. All you need to say is this call may be recorded for quality purposes or compliance. Yeah, we own that market. So everyone knows in that environment what we do. Everyone knows in Israel. Everyone knows... Um, across the seas. And, and essentially, NICE has been selling for the past, well, 20 years approximately to, to that environment, to the environment of contact centers and, and call centers. We were looking to expand our business into a new industry, the industry of the back office. And the back office are people who, on their day-to-day -day job, don't necessarily take calls. They use their desktop. They use other applications. They're still in customer service. But they don't, can we just speak up? Then I'll just give away the microphone, okay. Um, but they don't use, um, they don't use calls. Th that is my business. Th that's it, actually. And my main challenge was that all the efficiencies which NICE has realized in the world of a contact center, our customers were simply unaware of the fact that they could realize these same values in the back office. So in terms of efficiency gain, customer satisfaction, operational efficiency, all those kind of trends which everyone knows in the contact center, in the back office, there was no knowledge. So what was my challenge? My challenge was to approach an existing customer base of NICE and telling all of them in a clear, profound manner but we have a new solution which can give them efficiencies in their back office. When they thought, and by the way, most of them still do, but this isn't possible. It isn't feasible. How do I get that conversation? Thank you. David, I love your accent. You want to continue yeah. to? Good Ranana. So read it. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Rafi Kretschmer. Thank you, Kfir, for inviting me. Uh, next time I'll be sitting on the other side because the beers are there and here it's only water. Uh, so I joined Panaya a year ago and I was charged with the mission to transform the top lead uh, generating marketing organization in the market, or so I was told, into a strategic marketing machine, which means transplant a completely new mindset uh, into the company. So really implementing a hybrid marketing model, on one hand running with a lead generation stream that as you all know needs to bring the MQLs on a monthly basis, while in parallel running strategic account marketing activity. Why is that? Because the company and, and a strategic company level realized that in order to maintain growth, we cannot live anymore on those 100K deals. And we need to reposition Panaya as a strategic vendor to major accounts 
and significantly increase the average deal size. So this um, uh, posed two challenges. The first one is, of course, external. How do you take an Israeli uh, startup, although acquired by Infosys, but still uh, a mid-sized company, and position it to companies such as uh, GE, DHL, Mercedes-Benz, what have you? But more important than that, and I think that's more relevant for us as B2B marketeers, how to change the mindset within a sales force in an organization that was um, used to get MQLs, call them or not, do something with them or not, and then you as a marketing organization was marginalized into this, go and get us some MQLs. So how do you make this mindset shift in sales organization minds and say, hey, we're here, we bring to true value, we help you to generate business. So these are the two main challenges. So it seems that the key uh, issues that all of the marketers are facing are either people know our company as X, we need them to know that we can do additional stuff, mm -hmm. or hey guys, we're marketing, we're really important, right? We, we can actually bring business. We're not the guys who do just rebranding and events and, and, and like cool business cards from 200 grams papers, right? Okay, so this is a challenge that, uh, does anyone here face the same challenges? Need to change, okay, so you're saying no, what is your challenge? Okay, so we have one for awareness. Other challenges? I can relate to that. Yes, you can definitely relate to that. He's working for a small company, unknown. <laughs> Something in computers. Um, other challenges that are not on stage now? Going into down market if you're selling to large companies, right? That's one more challenge that some of the people here have. Uh, some of the people here have. Lead qualification, a huge challenge, which is a part of this value chain, right? Uh, to actually, again, to show the value internally and to actually bring business, qualification is a huge challenge. Okay, so you're here because you solved some of, or faced bravely some of these challenges and managed to uh, give at least some level of answer in a very innovative way. So tell us more. Thanks. So I have, uh, I think, three uh, examples, three cases that I would like to share with you. Um, first of all, uh, how many marketing managers are here? Just, you know, I'm not taking your, your lead, but real marketing managers. So my question, my question to you, who is your best buddy in your organization? Who is your best friend? Okay, no friends, no friends. Okay, this is the challenge. I would, oh, okay. No, but... What I would like to say, and this is uh, um, referring to my uh, first uh, introduction, is that I think uh, that the marketing best friend should be the sales, sales VP, salesman, etc., etc., because sales is a specific uh, format or form of marketing. This is one one to one one marketing. So um, I think. Um, when we are talking about the CMO, okay, the chief marketing officer, he has to earn the C, the chief. And I think the right way to earn it is not um, mainly doing some cool, innovative stuff, okay? Um, and again, he should be a um, money generator. So the salespeople should be your best friend because when you are talking about the bottom line and it, it doesn't matter if you are a big company like IBM or Nice or Panaya or a small startup um, people would like to see the results so you can do the best you know cool uh, event or campaign or something else but if you are not bringing value to the organization you can say bye bye to your job role so um, this is the first thing, and by that I'm going uh, to talk a little bit about the main challenge, which is how to integrate in the correct way the sales and marketing, okay? Um, there are many tension 
between marketing and sales. If you are looking about in uh, marketing forums, I know, and groups, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there are some uh, repeating questions. Uh, for instance, what is the differences between B2B and B2C? You know this question? What is the differences? Okay. But the other question is how sales and marketing are relating, or why there is so much tension between sales and marketing. And uh, in some cases there is, but when you uh, um, um, know how to reach the sales team in the correct way, you can re bring your real value. So. Um, the first, the first things that I would like to share with you is to set the right forum to integrate with your sales team. We are doing in IBM. I didn't uh, introduce myself. I'm the marketing manager for two divisions in IBM Israel: the cybersecurity and the systems, which is the, all the IT stuff. So we are doing it on uh, formally on a weekly basis. We are sitting together and uh, reviewing all the pipe. Uh, from sales and from marketing, from the campaigns, and uh, try to, to make some progression with that and qualification and things like that. But in the real life, we are talking all the time. So in, in small companies, I assume that you're in the same room, same place. But uh, when you're working on a huge organization, IBM is more for, more for I think, over 400,000 people around the world. In Israel, we are 2,400, so it's, it's more challenging. So the physical uh, um, uh, um, closure have uh, some impact. So we're talking very, very uh, intense. And um, building the foundation for this uh, internal collaboration with the with sales team. So the transparency is very, very uh, high. Um, the first thing that I would like to share with you, um, and I hope it's related to your question about uh, innovative, is how to take your sales team uh, and make them be your agent, okay? Your influencers. Um, and uh, what I'm running for the last six months is, um, I call it the social sales organization, something like that. Uh, so how you can take your sales force and make them your agent in the social network, in the social media. Um, and I'm talking about tens of salespersons, so it's a really huge impact. Um, it uh, spare a lot of budget from my uh, uh, marketing budget if I use organic sales force instead of paid media. So how you can make you agents and agencies, of course, mainly Pravda, and uh, so how you make them work for you when their target is bringing uh, their quotes, okay, the budget, their uh, their objectives. So uh, what I've started about six months ago is a roadshow um, across the country. Uh, is in IBM we have like ten locations across uh, Israel, from Haifa in the north to Beersheba. Um, so what I'm, I'm doing is a very uh, um, detailed workshops with the sales force, managers, employees, salespersons, but also uh, product managers and R&Ds, and uh, train them around uh, social networks. In the B2B, it's mainly LinkedIn, but also Twitter and Facebook and, and others. And uh, I can share with you some results. The result, it's, it's, it's nice. So um, for the last six months, I have trained around 500 people from IBM, like about 20, 25% of the entire organization in Israel. And we see a very significant increase in their engagement in social networks. So when I'm trying to, uh, um, when I do running a campaign and try to reach to the market, so in addition to the paid media campaign, I'm using the internal works, uh, workforce. And they were talking about very big numbers, 500 people. Each one of them have some hundreds of connections. So we're talking about 10,000 k thousands of uh, connection this is really really impact um, so um, I write down the some of the you know, results so first of all um, we have increased the number of members I'm talking about mainly LinkedIn by three percent during the last six months um, in adding more than uh, 20 okay more than uh, 20,000 
um, connection with an increase of 50% of the entire connections that IBMers have in Israel and worldwide. Um, the employees viewed, okay, this is a parameter, how many people viewed your Salesforce profile has been increased by 8%, and the number of companies connected to, this is uh, something that LinkedIn is measuring, how many connections do you have with other vendors in the market has been increased by 50% as well to more than 2,000. So currently I have um, 500 agents in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in my organization, which is mainly free, and uh, we set a specific process when we are pushing the button and we have like 500 people that uh, echo our messages to the market. Uh, in addition to that, I took uh, very specific uh, people that have uh, very unique positions and gave them uh, some personal uh, workshop trainings. And they are like our tiger team uh, for social. They are the most connected people. They are the influencers, and uh, I use it a lot, them a lot uh, during uh, some campaigns. So I can talk about this a lot, but uh, I will hand out the mic. <laughs> okay, thanks. So I'm actually going to point back um, to you, um, saying that you, you, you mentioned that you're a small company, small startup, and, and no one knows you. That's right. Well, sorry, customers. We're early stage. Okay, okay sorry. Okay, so we are, we're actually in the same boat with one difference, but I'm perceived as, as a large company. And in the domain of a contact center where I started, that's exactly where I was. Just imagine how challenging it is to be perceived as a large company by your executives, by your bosses, where in practice, in this new domain which you're, which you're addressing, you're perceived, you, you are someone new. You, you have no, no customers. How, how do you deal with that? And that was exactly um, where I stood. And I, and I wasn't in the position of generating new leads and, and, and generating um, new contacts. I had to show results. Um, what was mentioned here what was absolutely true. Um, putting jokes aside, sales at the end of the day we need to show a direct link between our marketing activities and sales. If anyone here will able be able to show that from leads he brought in, sales were generated, that's a win. The end. So that was my challenge. I think the challenge is clear. Yeah. So, um, the way we decided to address this, and it was a risk because we started this um, a year ago. We had no idea um, if it would work. Yeah, and it was a pretty fucked up idea as well to, to begin with, sorry. So let, let's just go what, what we did. Um, we, we decided to target for 40 potential customers, existing customers of NICE who knew of us in the contact center, but had no idea what our offering was in the back office. We targeted in these 40 customers, 40 individuals, people who we wanted to be the buyers. These are not the highest level, but pretty close to it. Director of operations, the director VP level, okay? We analyzed each one of these 40 people, who they are, we searched them in Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. This guy was born in Greece and came to the US at age of five. This guy uh, likes wine and has his own vineyard. This kind of data, yeah, crazy as it sounds. And for each one of these people, we created a dedicated video addressed to him. Hi, Rafi. How's it going? My name's David. I see you liking drink. I see you like drinking beer at seven o'clock in the morning, and you know that that kind of stuff. We we share the same passions. Well, huh? Yeah, we know pretty well. That's. But the the idea is once again to show that we know you, and then 
Rafi in Panaya, which is trying to position itself as having a new marketing machine, a new Atas with that strategy. So really taking something direct, which you know about that person and his objectives, and then positioning your offering, your solution, which is positioned directly to him. You cre we created that video, but rather simply sending um, a link in YouTube or Vimeo, we did the whole thing in uh, VR, virtual reality, put it in a smartphone, shipped it over to him with UPS or FedEx, this beautifully crafted box, which simply said on the side, on the, on the outside, imagine your back office. We opened it up, inside was the smartphone with a VR, short, extremely short instructions, a link for further information, which was a site which Pravda um, created very well, as well, by the way, and a business card. That's it. Simple as that. We sent those over, and our, my objective was to get five meetings out of those 40 we sent. Just to give some money in proportion here, each one of these videos with taking production and everything into account, it's anywhere between around the twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 yeah, for each one. But we knew each one who we were sending it to. This is not just simply shooting in the dark. A week later, the idea was the account executive would follow up because, of course, they knew who we were sending this to. And this goes to the point which you said before, working together with, with the sales. And we were able to get here 10 meetings. That's 25%. Now, if I get one deal, just one deal out of those meetings, rough deal size is anywhere between the two, three to ten million dollars. That makes everything worthwhile. Now this is something which we have never done before. It was extremely risky. Um, my luck was that um, Nice bought into this crazy idea, but it worked. We've got now 10 meetings. We, we had these 10 meetings. We've got 10 in the process and we're looking forward to the business. So just to, um, well, I see left, but what was said before, and just to close on this, you, you have to be, and this is my take, you have to be prepared to fail. I'm not saying that failing is a necessity, but if you're not prepared to fail, you never reach anything meaningful. I agree. Thank you, David. Pleasure. Uh, okay, who knows what is account-based marketing? Who tried to run an account-based marketing initiative? Who succeeded? Like two out of 50? I just proved right. the point, yeah. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> yeah. all right, so let me, let me tell you about the, the initiative we took in Panaya around the strategic accounts. I'll touch about awareness because this is a key part of our, of our plan, okay? I don't want you to feel that you're wasting your time, okay? So we're very generous here. So we, in Panaya, contracted with the, uh, for Abilis, which is a strategic company that helps us to craft this overall program, which was practically uh, divided into two phases, or three phases. The first phase is all about awareness. So we had a list of our 500 target major accounts, which we crafted together with our sales teams. So we narrowed it from like 4,000 to 500 based on specific profiles. Uh, and we embarked on a, uh, an awareness program, which was mainly, mainly media related. We profiled the target audience from director level and above. Uh, I would say director VP and to a certain extent the CIO. Um, and we just launched a media advertising campaign for Panaya, but in this case, 
placing Panaya in business-related portals, so Bloomberg and CNBC and Financial Times and Forbes, using uh, some very innovative marketing tools like Bitelec and Medicine Logic and so on and so forth. First, to position Panaya as a strategic vendor. It's not get this small startup from Israel, but we are there alongside with the big names like Cisco, Amdocs, Nice, what have you. Following that, we drove the traffic from those websites through the advertising to a dedicated mini site, or we call it a thought leadership hub around the main theme of our program, which in our case was around um, agility or agility in the context of ERP. So this was the first stage, to increase awareness for Panaya and drive traffic to a, thought leadership, uh, to a thought leadership hub. And within this thought leadership hub mini site, uh, we tried to convert them, okay? So we provided some of the content non-gated, some of the content gated. I think here I already um, provide you one tip always A-B test on a daily basis. We got some uh, very good information from Trendymon uh, to analyze what's the best headline, what's the best name for the ad, how to name the white paper, what's the, uh, the, the, the order of the placement of the content elements on the website, and so on and so forth. So we continuously analyze it to ensure that we get the highest uh, conversion rate from this mini site. I'll just share a few numbers which are staggering from a, from a Panaya perspective. We had 28,000 people uh, arriving into the website. Okay, from a Panaya perspective, it's like huge numbers. The click through rate on the mini site was 0.22%, which is three times the industry average. Okay, so we did all of that. We got like 450 contacts uh, engaging with us through the mini site. And here I think is where the innovation comes. I mean, aside of the digital awareness stuff, is really what do you do with that? In previous companies that I worked for, we would take the Excel spread, uh, spreadsheet, send it to the sales and say, hey, Idan downloaded the white paper, call him. Uh, Kfir, watch the video for two minutes, call him. Which is shooting yourself in the leg because you're investing a lot of time, uh, effort, and, uh, and money in order to practically provide the same MQL. So that's not a way. Going back to David's comment about aligning marketing and sales and making it uh, tightly coupled, what we did is we built a new measurement. We removed the mentioning of MQL or qualified lead as a term and we invented, quote unquote, a new measurement, which is account intent quality. So we were measuring engagement on the account level, okay? So we took a few parameters, some of them, how many contacts from the specific account engaged with us uh, in the mini site. On top of that, what's the overall behavioral score for this account generally around Panaya. How many MQLs did this account generate in the last three months? And so on and so forth. So we had like four or five parameters. We provided weights for each of them and calculated a score per each account. And with that, we were able to go to sales and say, hey, here's a list of top 50 accounts that engage with Panaya around a specific theme here are the names of people who contacted with us. This is what they did on the mini site. Call them. Here's the secondary offer. Set a meeting. Okay? On top of that, we took it to the next step and said, not just take the 50 accounts and do something. We analyzed specifically accounts that engaged for the first, for the first time with Panaya around this campaign. And I'll just throw in some names, H&M, Harley Davidson, AT&T, huge names, huge enterprises that were not aware of Panaya and definitely the Panaya sales force was not aware of them. And here's a concrete value you can bring to sales. Here's 
a, uh, a company, here's the contact, here's what they've done. Um, so we are running with that right now. I think the key here, uh, and, and I'll stop with that for, for the time being, is the follow-up process. Mm -hmm. You, as a marketing organization, are accountable for the follow-up process. Sending an email and saying, hey, we got some uh, leads, go and follow up, is not enough. Be accountable, call them, follow up on a weekly basis with the sales managers, with the, with the regional vice president, and so on and so forth. Make sure that the information you provide is being acted upon, that's the key. Um, I would like to uh, relate to that. Um, first of all, I think for, till now you didn't mention marketing automation. So, very good for you. But I think. Uh, <laughs> but I will. So, I think I think the process that you described is very close to um, how marketing automation systems can manage the client journey. We we haven't talked about client journey, but this is the journey. And uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm not going to sell any of IBM marketing automation processes, I don't. But um, this kind of technology can help us to uh, track the online and the offline activities and how to uh, integrate with this qualification process. With, it's really a challenge, you know, working with the, the sales team. So I, I think one of the key challenges that we faced is that our marketing automation uh, offering did not support qualification on an account level. So we had uh, to build it from scratch. This is a, main ch a major challenge. So we had Marketo running some of the email automation uh, and capturing the leads. However, we then had to take a Salesforce report, an Excel spreadsheet, and a Marketo report, and combine them to reach this account level uh, qualification. I think one of the challenges of uh, marketing automation tools today is the ability to elevate from the MQL level to the account level. Okay, so we're getting to the end of the panel. And what is very, very important is that people will leave this room not only half drunk, but more importantly, have a clear understanding how to maneuver within the organization in order to actually get the buy-in. I mean, all of you done, you guys are doing cool stuff, but it costs a lot of money. So it means in a specific point in time, you had to defend these ideas, crazy and unsubstantiated as they were while you were presenting them in order to get the backing for management because otherwise you can get manpower, resources, time, and so on. So there is a limit of amount of time you can schmooze the salespeople not to say that you're not helping, right? But you need somehow to get those either huge ships or very, very, very small kayaks, but still management to back up your initiatives, okay? What are your two, three tips for marketing managers and marketing executives to get the buy-in of the organization to do something that was never done before. Okay, so, um, you know, numbers, stocks, and uh, the bottom line uh, talks as well. So I think uh, the best approach is to uh, maybe to uh, have like two, three quick wins in your uh, organization. And I'm getting back to the sales, so try to find you know, the most cooperative salespersons in your organization, okay? Work with them. Try to set an account-based marketing campaign or very targeted campaign. It's not, it's not very uh, expensive. You can do a very nice campaign, a few thousands of dollars. It's not a very big amount of money, but you can uh, generate a very nice ROI of, out of that. I'm working mainly uh, around ROI 1 to 10, okay? And with a few case dollars event, um, campaign, you can generate um, several uh, hundred K of dollars in uh, win revenue. So I think um, when you get there, so if you have the, the right salesperson to work with, 
that cooperate, maybe uh, help you to engage with new clients, etc., etc. Maybe create content by himself. You have to sell this internally to the decision makers in your organization. So um, this is the reason you have to work very close with the sales because in B2B, um, in most cases, the sales organization have more impact uh, than the marketing organization. So. Um, this is, I think, the very effective route to the CEO, okay? Um, so try to make two, three quick wins, generate a lot of leads, wins, which is the, the most important, and sell it internally. It will be easier for you to get more resources. So this is my, uh, my tip. I have a lot of, but uh, we have a very short time. So if, if there's one thing which is which I think you should remember from this, so from, from my experience, is literally turn the account executive or the VP of sales into your stakeholder. Do not go into a marketing automation if you do not have full sales buy-in that they will be following up on these leads. And by the way, even, even when they say they will, question it. In, our, in my environment, my environment is account-based deals. And in that environment, that means I need to adapt myself to the sales requirements. So if they want specific leads, that's what I will build on. So we gave the example of these um, um, headsets, which fit well. And going on to what Thomas said, the moment there was a success, <laughs> we marketed the hell out of it internally, which helped get additional budget. If it's um, round tables on dedicated customers, make sure, though, the account executives knows and is in line and sponsors what you want to do. That would be my one point. Since I'm last, uh, I have three points. So the first one, I mean, the, the, the title of this uh, B2B marketing uh, event is innovation. And I think for marketing executives in this room, you need to realize that 80% of innovation will come from your employees. This is key. And, and make sure that you, that you strive to um, instill this culture within your, within your organization. Seriously, from small things like let's add Snipply to let's let's do some other crazy stuff on Facebook. 80% of innovation comes from your employees. Second, to the marketing managers here in the in this context of innovation, don't marginalize yourself into a specific siloed area of marketing. Like saying, I don't do email marketing. I'm in social media. Or, sorry, sorry, I'm web, so anything else is not related to me. Open yourself to other areas of marketing, and this inherently will, will initiate innovation. From how to convince the organization point of view, it's really about, and I'm, I'm relating to what Tomer mentioned earlier. So we set those big rocks, all right? We'll do account-based marketing, we'll do this initiative. This can take three to six months to generate value and you invested the money, and your manager or CEO, CEO is like, okay, Rafi, ma, what's going on? And you say, well, wait six months and, and I'll show you. This is not a good approach. What we need to do is to show in parallel to working on the big rock, incremental wins, incremental improvements in any area of your marketing organization. It can be improvement in email open rate, it can be improvement in traffic to your website, it can be improvements to how you do social, and so on and so forth. So don't only focus on this big rock, make sure that you make incremental wins and incremental successes in other areas of, of uh, the marketing organization. Can I add something? Uh, I have another question. Um, how many of you met a client for the last week? Okay, this is an old question. A client, a customer. Um, I'm asking that because uh, it, I think... Jerry, you're clearly in the advantage. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, 
I originally came from the sales organization, okay? I spent like five, six years uh, before I uh, joined to the marketing team in Microsoft. I was an account manager and handled the tens of clients. So I have a very, very good background in sales, but in marketing and in many of the cases, it's, it's easier for us to stay in the office and you know design very cool campaigns and know the last a cool feature in Facebook and Google, whatever. It's really nice, I love it as well, okay. But we have to remember that uh, the most important thing is to know your customers. So, and there's a lot of articles in the last, uh, I think, few weeks about the positioning of the marketing and organization I saw today that was uh, very nice as well and um, we have to remember that marketing is not a is not a hype okay it's not the cool stuff it's not the you know all the glory it's a uh, it's really hard work it's, uh, internally uh, to have uh, the right position in the organization and to bring again real value so my uh, second tip for you is meet your customers meet your clients know them this is marketing okay to make an impact on the behavior of the clients, of the customers, so know them. It will be easier to you for you to design very impactful and effective, real campaigns. Okay, this is the the last thing. You know, when we want to do this event about innovation, and while I'm listening to all of your answers, what we actually see here, I don't know if 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 all of you are seeing that. We can change the topic now. We can change the topic. I will just change the landing page. It's you know it's easy, but um, there is a major debate in the B two B marketing community about the roles of B two B marketers. Okay, there are a lot of discussions about the fact that B two B marketers are different from B two C marketers. That B two C marketers can do the cool stuff. B two B marketers need to buy lunch to the salespeople. Right <laughs> now. The reason I'm saying that is that all the points that you've raised is that actually the power of marketers, of B2B marketers today, is their ability to go back to the CEO and tell him or her, dude or woman, do this. Do this. Look, you gave me X, I brought back 10X. Nobody cares about cool stuff anymore. The god of marketing is the Excel. Now, I completely agree with you, like we, because I run an agency, so my challenge is 10 times your challenge, right? Because I'm from outside the organization. My team works with companies and need to find ways to do quick wins while we can talk with sales teams in most cases. We don't, we don't have the ability to meet the clients of our clients, right? The important point thing is as a result of what all of you said, at the end of the day, marketing, B2B marketing in 2017 depends on one thing and one thing only, and it's ROI. All the rest doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you do an amazing campaign creatively, if you have this amazingly produced video, at the end of the day, was there an opportunity or not? I don't know if I'm happy or unhappy with that result, for us as a company, it fits our vision, but for the larger scale industry, it's, uh, it's questionable, let's put it this way. Um, but what I really like to do is to thank you for sharing all those insights. Um, I found it very, very interesting and very educating. So thank you very much for spending time with us.